So every marriage is a portrait, is a picture of Christ and the church. Now some of those marriages are better than others, right? Some of them paints a, a clearer picture. Some of them uh, paints a, a, a more richer picture than others. But marriages always point to the glorious bridegroom, Jesus, and the beautiful bride, the church. That's what we see in, in Ephesians chapter 6, right? Uh, he is telling us, he is not speaking about just man and woman. He is speaking about Christ and the church. And I don't think there is really any other picture of marriage. Maybe the Song of Solomon, but even so, I think that the, that, that the picture of, uh, of Isaac receiving his bride is probably the greatest picture of Christ and the church that we see in Scripture. There are a lot of them, right? And you've got the Song of Solomon, you've got an entire book, Song of Solomon, that we can look at and see the beauty of Christ and his bride. We've got Hosea, right? And, and Gomer. And how, how Hosea redeems Gomer. We have Ruth and Boaz. There's a lot of them, but I think really that Isaac and Rebekah, I think the, this whole portrait that we see here in chapter 24 is probably the best that we see of the gospel. Not only just in Genesis, but in the Old Testament. And it's a long passage, like I said, and we're not, we're not going to be able to cover every single verse, so I would, I would recommend you go home and, uh, and you take... Your Bibles, and you open up to chapter 24, and you read through chapter 24. Maybe you go through chapter 23 because that kind of leads into obviously chapter 24 because that's how numbers work. 23. What's next? 24. Very good. Okay, so so um, so that's how it kind of works. So so that's. Uh, but I would I would absolutely recommend going there. Now, as we read this section, I want us to to look. I, I normally try to be a very good Baptist pastor and give you three points. Uh, I usually leave off the poem. Uh, but I tried to do one today. I've got five that we're going to go through. We're going to go through them rather quickly. Uh, but I think that we, because of this, um, because this pinpoint uh, points so much to Christ in the church, uh, I want us to get a full picture of it. So the first thing that we're going to uh, look at is uh, the, the selection. And we're going to look at the sending. And after we look at the sending, we're going to look at the uh, securing and the sealing. And then ultimately, sealing is an S E A, not C I or C E I. Uh, but uh, and then we're going to look at the ceremony. That one does go with the seat. There is no S on that one. So there's four S's in a C that we're going to be looking at as we go through this. Now, I have to be honest with you. I want to, I want to say this uh, to you because about 20 years ago, I'm listening to Adrian Rogers, and he's and I'm listening through his entire series on Genesis, and he gets to this chapter here. And my mind was blown. It forever changed the way I looked at Isaac and Rebecca. It forever changed the way I looked at Genesis. This is, I put it on Facebook this morning, but this is, uh, from, from that sermon on, this is where I went, there is the gospel in Genesis. And this is, this sermon that I heard 20 years ago is the genesis of the genesis of the gospel for me. Okay? And I've been looking forward to this sermon since we began. And, and I kind of talked about it in Sunday schools on at different times and what have you. But, but this is the one that I just really love to look at because this is the portrait of Christ in the church that we see. I'm not saying that this is allegory. This happened. This is historical truth, historical fact. I'm just saying that it also points to Christ in the church that we that we look at. So again, going through it, there is the, there's the uh, selection, or the selecting, there is the sending, there is the securing, there is the sealing, and then ultimately there is the ceremony. So we're going to start with the selection. Now it's been quite some time since uh, since Abraham uh, had, had taken Isaac to Mount Moriah in order to sacrifice. It's been years and years since all of that has, has, has transpired, has taken place. And so there, uh, therefore, a lot has taken place. And one of the things that took place during this time is that Sarah, Isaac's mother, Abraham's wife, has died. She died in, in chapter 23. That's what leads up to this. Now, uh, Sarah was about 127 years old. If we think about that, then we're looking at uh, when, when she died. So if we're thinking about that, we do the math. We remember that Isaac was born when Sarah was 90 years old. That means Isaac is at least 37 years old. We see in the next chapter, ultimately, that Isaac was 40 years old when, this, uh, when, when he actually got married. So sometime 39, 40 years old is probably when all of this is taking place, depending on how long it took for the servant to get down to Abraham's uh, country and, 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 and city and to get back uh, with, with, um, with Rebecca. So he's probably about 39, 40 years old when all this is taking place. Remember that he was considered to be maybe a boy uh, or maybe just a young man, a young teenager about this time when he was, sat, uh, was about to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. So we're talking about a long time has, has transpired between then and now. And it's time now for him to get married. 
So we look at verses 1 through 4. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had. Now this is probably, possibly, uh, uh, Eliezer. We see that a few chapters back, that Eliezer was the one that, uh, that Abraham was going to make heir of all that he had. He is his most trusted servant, and he is his senior servant that, has, that is over all he has. So this is Eliezer, unless Eliezer has sometime at this point died and he has appointed somebody else. Probably, but I'm not going to be specific on that. I'm not going to be dogmatic on that. He says to him, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. And so as we read this passage, we, oh, it's very easy to just kind of go and gloss over this and not really think about what's going on here. But, uh, but And so we miss maybe two, two things here. And there are very important things. One, the first one, would be that Abraham is the one who decided that it was time for Isaac to get married. We don't see Isaac actually so much playing a whole big role in this. I mean, he probably did. I mean, he probably consented, you know, and went to him and talked to him, but we don't see that. We see Abraham taking charge of Isaac's marriage. The second is that Abraham was the one who decided from what people to bring Isaac's bride home. What people the bride must come from. The bride must not come from the Canaanites. Must come from his own people. So while the selection is broad in some ways, it's also very narrow in others. It is, it, it, it's broad in that it, 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 it includes his people, his kindred, the people that are actually related to him. How many people are there that are related to Abraham? How many, how many brothers did he have? Quite, quite, quite a few, few brothers. How many did nephews and, and nieces and, and cousins would he have? He had probably quite a few. But they had to come from the kindred, not even just not from the Canaanites, but also not from those of the Chaldea, right? Of the Chaldeans, right? Not from them either. Only from my kindred can the, can the bride come. Only from my family can you select a bride for my son. So not just anyone can be Isaac's bride. We see something very similar in the marriage of Christ and the church. So the imagery, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I'll be honest with you, right? You're gonna look at it and you're gonna, okay, that's a different image, but the imagery it may be different, but the principle is the same. The same. Concept applies, the same doctrine applies. So go with me real quick to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians because here he's not talking necessarily about a bride and groom, he's talking about sons and being adopted. We get Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, every, uh, in, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's what he says there. That we are chosen, that he is the one who is doing the selecting. In fact, if you go to, real quick to John chapter 6, we see this. Look at verse 24. Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking some, some very hard truths to the Jews. They're, he's got this huge following. People have just started following him after the, the feeding of the 5,000, and they're coming, and they're following him all over the place. And they're, they're even going around huge lakes in order to be where he is, in order to see what he has to say. And he starts to preach to them, and he starts preaching some very difficult truths, truths that will ultimately lead almost all of them, except for maybe the 12, to abandon him. And one of those truths that he preaches is this in John chapter 6, verse 44. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Not just anybody can or will become the bride of Christ. Just like they, they cannot or will not become the bride of Isaac. They will not or cannot become the bride of Christ. The bride is selected even more narrowly by God than Abraham. So 
there is a selection that we see. But then there's also the sending. Go back to, to Genesis now. This is chapter 24. Because we see that Abraham is, is making his servant, again, probably Eliezer, but don't know that for sure, but making his servant swear to him that it will only be to his kinsmen that he goes, only to the people of his choosing to bring back a bride for his son. Only his, not just his son, but his only son, his only begotten son, Isaac. And the servant wants to know, what if she refuses? What if she doesn't want to come back? What then? And I want you to, I want you to understand something, because, because Abraham answers and says, basically, that if she decides not to come back, she doesn't want to come back, then you don't make her come back. And, but here's the thing. Here's what, Isaac, or here's what Abraham is more concerned about than the fact that, well, what if she doesn't want to come back? He is more concerned for the fact of, do not ever take my son to her. Do not take my son back to Canaan. Or, I'm sorry, to, to, to uh, Chaldea. Don't, don't take him back there. The bride comes to him. So Abraham then goes ahead and releases his servant from the vow if she decides that she doesn't want to come back. As long as he doesn't take him back to her. And so he sends his servant. But he doesn't do so empty handed. Look at verse, verse 10. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of gifts, choice gifts, from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. So before the servant is sent out, he secures treasure to give to his future bride. <coughs> He's, he's got these choice gifts. He's got these treasures that he, he is going to, to go. He's got ten of his master's camels filled with treasure. That sounds like a whole lot of treasure. That sounds like a whole lot of gifts, does it not? I mean, you think, how much can a camel hold? A camel can hold quite a bit. And there's ten of them, and they're all holding the treasures that comes from, from God. I mean, excuse me, from, from, from Abraham, ultimately by, by God. And we, we're going to see that this is not all that Abraham has. There's still more to come. This is just a sampling of what Abraham has. But he is taking them and is being sent on his way in order to lavish them upon the bride for Isaac. All these wonderful treasures for a bride who has never even heard probably the name of Isaac. Never seen him, met him, never heard of him. She's never known Abraham. Never known Isaac. But when the servant gets finished showing her how wonderful, how gracious, how generous, how giving his master is, her heart will be filled with love. Her heart desire to go back. That, that is the emphasis, that is the hope, that, that, is, that is what they are looking for, that is what will happen, that her heart will become transfixed upon the master's son. That's the plan. And so by taking so many gifts, the bride will know that her new husband is not only rich, though he is, but that he will be, he, uh, that, that, that he and his father will lavish her in riches, not just that, but that she will never have to worry about being insecure. She will never have to worry about them leaving me. She will never have to worry about them abandoning us. She will always be taken care of. That there is such there that she can take assurance. So the servant goes out, sent by the father to gain a bride for the son. Rebecca's not expecting him. She doesn't know that somebody's on their way. She hasn't been sent a telegram that says, hey, be looking out for this guy. He's got ten candles and a whole lot of goodies. Right? Nothing like that. He is sent out. Rebecca's not expecting him. Her family's not expecting him. He's going to come suddenly. And he's going to woo her heart. He's going to 
change her heart. And such it is with the Holy Spirit. Look at me real quick, John chapter 3. Jesus just told Nicodemus that he must be born again. It's not a physical rebirth. It is a spiritual rebirth. It is a change of the heart. And so he says in chapter 3, verse 8, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says, The wind blows where it wishes and hears its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You're not expecting it. You don't see it coming. It just all of a sudden hits you. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and He is changing your heart before you even realize that it's even happening. That's, that's what's going on with, 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 with the servants and, and with Rebecca. This is what's going to be going on with every single person that is actually coming to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Go with me to the 16th chapter of John. Just a, just a little bit down. A few, few pages. Look at verses 8 through 11. Jesus is speaking this to his disciples on his way to, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, and when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and, and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no, uh, no longer. Concerning judgment, because the rule of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit comes to change the hearts and to change the life, to transfix people to Christ. That's what he does. That's what he is about. And that's what the servant here, Abraham's servant, is about. That God. The Holy Spirit sent from the Father to gain a bride for the Son, the only begotten Son, and He goes among a people who do not know the Father and who do not know the Son, and He goes among a people who are not expecting Him, and yet He comes upon them often suddenly. And upon getting there, reveals the Father and the Son to whom He has been, uh, who, who has sent Him. And upon arrival. We see with the servant. The servant goes and he rests the camels. Go back to Genesis 24. As he's resting his, in his camels, he prays that God would reveal the woman whom he has chosen for Isaac. And so he asks for a certain sign. He basically says, God, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this woman. And when I Ask for a drink of water. I, I ask that this woman would not only give me a drink, but after she has given me a drink, that she would go ahead and give a drink to my camels and, and, and drink all, uh, give, uh, give, give water to all my camels so that they are satisfied as well. Now think, how many camels did he have? Ten. Have you ever seen a camel drink water? They can drink gallons. So we're talking about ten camels that have gone across a desert that can drink gallons upon gallons of water, and the woman by herself is supposed to go, after I'm done with you, let me get some water for your camels. Let me just draw that up for you. How many times does she have to lower that pitcher and bring out water? It's a hard, grueling task. That's what, that's what he is looking for a bride. There is Rebecca, and she comes, and she does it. He doesn't say, hey, can you give me a little bit of water from my candle? She offers to do it. And look at the reaction of the servant. Look at verse 22. When the candles had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels. That's a lot of, a lot of gold. 
And we find out that actually what, that, that ring that he gives her, he, we find out later, is actually not a, a ring that goes on the finger, but a ring that goes in the nose. He puts a nose ring on her. I personally am not a big fan of nose rings, but you know, he eats his own. He does this though. He, he, he adorns her in beauty. She's already beautiful. The Bible already says in Genesis 24, it already says that she looks beautiful. And he is then enhancing that beauty with this ring. Can you, can you imagine though her reaction to this? You know, hey, can I get you some, some water for your camels? Sure, go ahead. And then she spends probably a couple of hours getting water for the camels and then comes back and he is just going berserk and he puts a nose in her ring. And a uh, uh, nose in her ring. A ring in her nose, right? I'm getting there. Uh, and, and gold bracelets upon her, right? And, and he doesn't say a word as he's doing this. He just does it. And then he says, hey, who are your parents? And he's already decided this is the woman for the son, this is the bride for the groom. Oh, by the way, my servant said, or my, my master says, that has to be from his family. Who's, whose parents do you belong? Who, who do you belong? She says that the fool is her father. Abraham's parents. Perfect! But he doesn't say anything after that. He, he just praises God for this. So maybe possibly for the first time, Rebecca has actually heard Abraham's name. And Rebecca runs home to tell her family what just happened to her. Laban, her brother, goes out to meet the servants and invite them into the home to have dinner. Finally, there is an explanation of this servant's what seems like erratic behavior. So they sit down to dinner. The dinner is being placed in front of them. And look at verse 34 and 35. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, Camels and donkeys. Now notice here that the servant is not making much of himself. He's not like, hey, I am the best servant in the entire world. I am so awesome. I am so great because I have gone on this long journey for my master. No, he doesn't do that. He points to his master. Look at how wonderful he is. He blesses God for those things that he has given to Abraham, but he makes much of Abraham and ultimately will make much of Isaac, but very little of himself. He's just a servant. He is doing the will and the, the bidding of his, his master. Look at verse 36. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to him he has given all that he has. He has inherited it all. We take you to Philippians chapter 2, where we see that Christ inherits all. We need to take you to Hebrews chapter 1, where Christ inherits it all. The servant makes much of Abraham, much of Isaac, in order to make them, make them irresistible to Rebecca, these sound amazing. These sound wonderful. These sound glorious. This distant cousin whom they have never met before had won their hearts. At least that was the hope. But it didn't just have to be with Rebecca. It had to be with the family, specifically the fool. The father had to give his blessing. So after explaining everything, going through the entire story, the servant gets to the point. Look at verse 49. Now that if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Tell me what you're going to do. Tell me what your thoughts are. Tell me if I'm wasting my time. Should I go somewhere else? The question is not simply will or will they not allow Rebecca to marry Isaac, really, though. The question is this Do they have steadfast love for Abraham? This distant cousin whom they have never 
met. Most likely did not met. Do they love him? Had he won their hearts, had he won their consent, in verse 50 and 51, then Laban, the fool, answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord, we cannot speak to you bad or good. Can't say one thing or another, right? Just, this is God's thing, this is God's thing, right? We're not going to... Add to it, we're not going to subtract from it, we're not going to speak good, we're not going to speak bad, it's just what it is. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. So it is with the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy, like the servant who, who had begun to woo Rebecca's heart, even before Rebecca even knew who he was, even before he, she knew who Abraham and Isaac were, he begins to go ahead and woo her by placing all these lavish gifts upon her. He's, he's, he's wooing her heart for her uh, for her, her, her future husband, her future father-in-law. So it is that the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart of the other believer. Go back to Genesis. I'm sorry, uh, to, to John chapter three. Let's talk about verse 3. This is where he says this, right? Jesus answered him, talking to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless their heart is changed, unless they are born from above, is the literal translation, of, right? Unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He must be rebirthed. He must first, before anything else, have his heart changed towards the Master. Towards the Father, towards the Son. <clears throat> the rebirth of the Spirit, the heart of the unbeliever, leads them into an understanding of God, to an understanding of Jesus that they've never known before. It leads them to, to know God, it leads them to know the Son like never before, but more than just knowing them, it leads them to love them, it leads them to desire what they are and who they are and what they are about, and their desire becomes, the, 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 the son, the, the father and the son's desire becomes the desire of the person, the person that is being rebirthed. Go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians, because Paul is writing to those Corinthians and he is trying to explain this, and I think he does such a great job of it. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14. I think I forgot to put this one up on the, on the slide, so just go with me real quick to 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14. You know, since it's not on the slide, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back. Verse 9. Was that, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man has imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one com uh, comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have not received... No, I'm sorry, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. We impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, inter uh, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person, the person who is unsafe, the person who is not a believer, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he will not be able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Until the person is born of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, he cannot understand the things of God. He cannot understand what God is doing. He cannot understand who Christ is and who God is. It is just fog. It is just folly. It is foolish. 
because he must be born again. The person who has been born of the Spirit. Yeah, the believer. These things become understandable. Not only do they become understandable, but they become lovable and desirable. So we see, go back to John chapter 15. 15, 26. And Jesus speaking to his disciples on the way to Gethsemane. Still speaking of the Holy Spirit, he says, But when the Helper comes, when the Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Okay? Servant. Servant of Abraham talks to the family, and he talks to the family about whom? Abraham and the Son. He doesn't speak about himself. He speaks about Abraham and the Son. And their journey that they have sent in mind in order to bring a bride back to the Son. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit focuses on the Father, focuses on the Son. To make much of them to the bride of Christ. So having heard the, the word of truth from Abraham's servant and having believed the good news of marriage, of, of the marriage proposal, the, the servant once again lavishes gifts upon Rebecca and her family. Here's some more. Enjoy. I've got tons of it out there. My, 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 my master is just full of wonderful blessings. And he seals the deal right then and there. You said yes, and so you are not his. And here is the proof, and I am giving these things to you as showing a sign of seal that we are on our way. She's now betrothed to Isaac at that very moment. Go with me real quick back to Genesis chapter 24, verse 52 to 53. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. So also he gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And then after sleeping, uh, sleeping there for, for the night, right, they, they meet him there and they go to bed. And he gets up early in the next morning and he says to them, I must be on my way. Let me take Rebecca back with me. I need to take Rebecca back now, ASAP. I'm like, hey, can't she just stay for a little bit of time? Please want to say goodbye. I'm going to have maybe a going away party. You know, can't we just do that, something like that just to wish her well? And he's like, don't delay me. Don't delay this marriage. He pressed them on the urgency of leaving, and so they allowed Rebecca to decide. They were 58, 59. And they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent Rebecca, their sister, and, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And as they left, we see this. Look at verse 61. Then Rebecca and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Those camels that he brought with all those treasures on it most likely hasn't all been given. Maybe so, maybe not. Probably not. She's riding amongst them. Amongst all the treasures is the greatest treasure he brought. Probably along the way, he's giving her more and more time, more and more about the son that she was about to, to marry. And I love, I loved uh, Adrian Rogers when he, when he preached on this, and he said, you know, like any any bride, especially if she's never even met the groom before, will he love me? Will he like me? Will he want me? Am I going to be good enough? And every time the servant would say. My, my master and his son wants you to have this to show that he loves you, 
to, to remind you that you are his and he is yours, that he will not be. And to lavish her with the, with the understanding that though they have not seen each other face to face, she is still loved. Each time would remind her that her future was secure. Each time they would remind her that her husband loved her. Each time they would remind her that Isaac would take care of her until one day, as we see in verses 64 and 65, and Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. Don't forget, we just read just a few verses before that it was the servant who had adorned her with all his jewelry and the garments. That it was the servant who had given her and made her way for her master, or for her husband, excuse me, his master's son. She was a bride adorned and ready for her bridegroom. Rebecca was sealed and adorned. By that servant, and so it is with the Holy Spirit. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1 now. He dwells in us, and He dwells with us all the way home. He is our guarantee that the Son loves us. He is our guarantee that the Son will never abandon us. He is our guarantee that the Son is there for us always and forever. And He makes us ready. He adorns us, getting us ready to meet the Son, all those gifts, all those moments of holiness, right? All those times where maybe we didn't do something right, and, and then there's conviction, confession, the Holy Spirit says, you have been forgiven, He still loves you, let us move forward. Here is, here is this, here is this. does this until we acquire the possession of our inheritance, until the moment that we are with Christ. Genesis 24. Verse 66 and 67. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. She became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. There's a ceremony. The bride and the bridegroom finding together as it was meant to be. A long, arduous journey back, but finally together. So it shall be with all those who will be first Thessalonians. Chapter 4. So in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. With the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. This journey is taking probably longer than we are or hoping, longer than we expected. And that's okay. It doesn't mean... That we have been abandoned doesn't mean that we have 
been left behind just simply means that, not, that, that the bride has not been complete. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be exposed. But it'll come. Right? They were walking, or riding along on that, on that camel, and suddenly, there before her, in the field, walking to them, is her husband. Before she knew that happened. So here it is. The word of truth is laid before you. Like the servant before Rebecca and her family, the question is posed Do you have a steadfast love for God, for the Lord? Or to say another way, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Spoken a lot about the Holy Spirit today, not so much about the Son, except that there is going to be a marriage. But the Son is the one who died to secure our salvation. If you will trust in Him. He lived the life that you and I are required to live. He suffered the wrath of God that we are required to suffer. Doing so in our place, he rose again to defeat death, to defeat graves, to defeat the guilt, to defeat the judgment that would be over us, that we who believe would be forever with him. Without fear of condemnation, without fear of wrath, but only joy in our hearts. And if you will put your full confidence in him, then the Holy Spirit will enter in, he will dwell in you. He will secure you, he will seal you, and he will bring you all the way to glory, to be with the Lord, and to return. Today, if you hear his voice, do not 